The next paper is presented by Jeff Hoops from the University of North Carolina, and it's on tax boycotts. Uh, it will be discussed by Inga Hadek from the University of Regensburg. Um, unfortunately, Inga can't be with us today. Um, she just uh, had a baby three days ago. Um, fortunately for us, she anticipated this happening um, and has um, recorded a video of her discussion. So we will still see her comments and also see them uh, in person. Uh, but now I hand over the word to Jeff. Okay, well, thank you so much for this opportunity to present and just get my screen situated here like I want it. Uh, I, tried it I was gonna try a different configuration, but it might not work, we'll see. So again, thank you uh, for the chance to present. And I want to apologize kind of in, in advance for the ugliness of my face. So it's all swollen today, uh, uglier than usual. Uh, I won't go into like the full details of the story. I'll just just kind of suggest Scott Dying's a little bit sensitive about his the small truck that he drives, and he shouldn't make any comments about it or, you know, things can happen. Okay, I'm going to present today the paper tax boycotts. This is co-written with Scott Acey, uh, Jake Thornock, and Jaron Wild. And kind of the genesis of this paper really comes from, <clears throat> you know, of all things, uh, kind of at least from my perspective, for the, the teaching that I do. So I teach tax and business strategy, as many of us do. And in this class, we talk about all taxes, all parties, and all costs. Where there's all these different costs that we talk about, <clears throat> but one of these costs is reputational costs, where we say, you know, tax. Uh, corporate tax executives don't engage in tax planning because partially like they don't want the public to get upset at their firms. The question then like, is that is that really a thing? Like do companies actually get face backlash from consumers? Now, if you just are an observer of the media or, or if you've come to these conferences before, certainly we've seen examples and we've seen people getting really upset about, about um, this kind of events. We have here a protest outside of Vodafone store. The phone store is actually closed down more Vodafone examples. We have this guy laying on the floor saying, let's kill a corporation. We have these people dancing around in beer bottle suits. We see this uh, Starbucks had this kind of famous example in the UK a while back and, and again, stores were closed down. So you certainly see these examples of like consumers and others activists getting really upset about uh, tax planning. Here's a US example, a GE. Um, but the question is, is there actually a measurable response in the amount of product people actually buy because of all of these examples that, that we've seen that seem like pretty relevant? I mean, here we have Starbucks literally, um, you know, boarded up the, their store so that people wouldn't break the windows there. Uh, but the question is, do we actually see a change in actual purchase? So the research question is, do consumers boycott the products of companies as a result of corporate tax planning. So what kind of our motivation, aside from teaching, is we do have some, some evidence in the literature about this. So to me, the most important literature evidence we have is that if you just ask tax executives about this, they say like, yes, this is definitely a thing. We're very worried about this. This actually influences our behavior. Uh, so this is Graham, Hanlon, Shevlin, and Shroff, and, and, they, and they basically ask like, you, you certainly could do more tax planning than you currently do. Why don't you do more? And the most important thing that, that executives point out is that the transaction less business purpose, uh, number one point. But number two and number four are, are to me pretty much very related. And they're like, we don't want to end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal because that would have reputational costs. So two of the first four reasons that these tax executives list as reasons why they don't engage in more tax planning are reputation cost related. However, the challenge is, is we've had a really hard time in the literature actually documenting these real costs. So for example, we have the, the Gallimore paper in, in Carr um, that you know, goes to like this, this it's like this array of tests and they just can't seem to find any evidence that being in the newspaper, for example, about a negative tax thing actually uh, was costly to firms. Uh, there's experimental papers that, that do kind of try to do the same thing, um, but we really just have this limited evidence that the reputational costs of tax planning are, are actually a thing. Now, what we when you actually try to observe the direct outcome, like consumers actually purchasing or something like that, what we do have evidence, like I just mentioned of, is that tax executives both say and then act like they believe what they say, 
that there are tax bonding uh, costs. So for example, I just showed you the graph of Hamlin at all. They say that there are these tax reputational costs. And then we have several papers. I've just noted these two because of course, now that I have to be friendly to Scott, so he doesn't beat me again, I'll mention his two papers, uh, Dyering et al. 2016 and Dyering et al. 2020, that they act consistent with this belief that there are these reputational costs of, uh, of tax planning in those two papers. But I mean, if you, if you just sit back and think about it, like it shouldn't really be surprising that tax executives think a lot about taxes and probably assume that other people think about taxes at least occasionally themselves. But I would, I would, you know, to me, the thought experiment I do is like, think of somebody in your life who doesn't have anything to do with taxes. So it could be your mom or your dad, your friend, your brother, sister, spouse, child, whatever. If you call this person up and say, when was the last time you talked when you thought about corporate taxes? They'll say, like, never, the last time you've made me think about them. Like, they don't do this on their own. And I think that that's probably broadly consistent with the general population. So the fact that tax executives think that people are thinking about taxes all the time, that there is this cost, isn't necessarily indicative that these costs actually exist. So what we're gonna do in this paper, we're gonna do several different things. And we start with this question, the challenge in the literature to answer this question, there's no particularly good way, there's like no particularly flaw-free way to answer this question. And so what we're gonna do is, is try several different flawed ways uh, each have their own kind of unique challenges, but we're we're hoping that in trying to answer the question several different ways that we're going to be able to like triangulate in and kind of understand this this question a little bit better. So the first question here, or the first the way we go about this is a survey. So we use Qualtrics. We recruit about 500 people. We pay them seven dollars per person, which like the, the cheap accountant inside me that just hurt hurt my soul to pay seven dollars for seven minutes of work, uh, but but we did it. Uh, we got quota sampling, so we got a representative sample, a representative along these different parameters, gender, age, income, education, political affiliation, and we're going to ask them these questions, and the, to me the key feature of this is we ask them these questions kind of in an important order, and at first we don't tell them anything about taxes. So there's been survey evidence before on this, and ex especially experimental evidence on this, but in all cases in which I know, I mean, it, to me it basically goes like this. So do you care about taxes? And they'll say, mm, yeah, I care about taxes. Which is challenging because you already told them, like, I, the researcher, cared enough about taxes that I like set up this giant lab and I'm going to pay you this money. I recruited, went through all this work. Like, please, I'm begging you, just tell me to care about taxes. Um, and it might not be the, the best way to see whether people actually care about taxes in this context or not. So, what we're going to do again is, is kind of go down this list of questions first, not priming them about questions, and later on we will, we will mention text. So, the very first thing we do is just ask, like, have you ever boycotted a company? And like very, to begin with, like 62% of people haven't boycotted at all. So if you're worried about like getting boycotted from consumers, this is like a minority of people that will do this in the first place. The second uh, question we ask is, if you have boycotted a company, tell us why. Again, we have yet to say the word tax. And so we just say, here's like a box, type whatever you want in it. And you know, I was one of the many people who got to read through all these different comments and code them in these different categories. It, it, these are kind of researcher produced categories uh, and they truly do type whatever they want. Uh, but of these, like we had six different people categorizing these and everybody was in complete agreement while these different categories were kind of hard sometimes to, to put in context or to, to put in categories. There is a complete agreement that nobody said anything about tax. So we had zero people that if you just say, hey, since you just said you boycotted a company, what was it about? And exactly zero said, well, it, it was taxes. So then we say, well, OK, so you know, maybe, maybe the world could change. Maybe companies will do something you don't like in the future. Could you ever imagine a world in which you did boycott someone? And if so, what could it be about? So we said, like, of the potential reasons you would be willing to boycott, uh, list anything. And again, a lot of uh, a lot of subjective kind of labeling on these different things here. But there were two out of these sixteen hundred and fifty four reasons that people could conceivably imagine boycotting companies that were tax. So again, the important part is we didn't we didn't ever tell them we were tax researchers. They didn't know that this was about taxes. If you just say, like, think about boycotts, what comes to mind? Uh, very, 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 very few people thought about taxes. So then we, so then we kind of ratchet down a little bit now. We're going to actually mention taxes. So here in this survey, a question that the word taxes shows up. We basically say, look, you're going to purchase a product. You have all sorts of different uh, things to think about. What are the most important? 
And the very first importance is quality of product is high. Uh, make uh, made Jake Thornock happy. He's a very like high quality kind of person. The second is the purchase price is low. I'm a very cheap person, so that made me very happy. So we got me and Jake's bases covered. Uh, but down here at the very bottom, literally the lowest mean ranking, although statistically uh, identical, I guess, to the second most, uh, the second lowest ranking, is the company pays its fair share of taxes. So again, now we are including taxes, but one of like many, many, many different things that they would worry about. And of these many things, it's literally the very last. Literally, the mean is the very last, and statistically, it's tied for last with one other thing. Now, you might ask yourself, like, why did we use this term fair share? It's a very good question. We could have used all sorts of different phrases here. I don't know what effect those different phrases would have had, uh, but fair share seems to be one of the con one of the ways, probably the most prominent way that the media characterize companies' tax payments. And since the media's goal in, uh, is often to inflame people and get them excited, we use, thought we'd use that same thing, hoping to uh, get somebody to get excited about this, but we just weren't very successful. Nobody seemed very excited about taxes, unfortunately. It's like my class that I teach all over again. No excitement whatsoever. Okay, so then we say, um, so again, we've asked like, what do you think about? In, in purchasing, then you say, well, like you, you, might, you might think about not buying something. Here's some different categories of reasons you might do that. And here taxes aren't last, but they're like somewhere in the middle. So this would be, how likely would you be to stop buying a product or service because they engage in the following activities? So taxes were low on the list, but not very last, okay? And then finally we ask, and this is to me, this is pretty similar to what, um, you know, the survey evidence would do, the experimental evidence would do beforehand, is we basically say, hey, have you ever boycotted about taxes? And now we get just under 10% of people saying, yes, uh, definitely boycotted about taxes. Even though when we asked them several questions ago, I mean, about approximately five minutes before in the survey, we said, have you ever boycotted? Most of them said no. And then we said, well, about what exactly? Zero said taxes, now 10% say taxes. And so this is, you know, a challenge with this type of type of research and, and this way of doing it that we completely understand as a limitation is what people say, what people do, what people are called, they're all three different things. Uh, but, you know, kind of this is the first way that we're going to try to address this question of tax boycotts is simply ask people, did you boycott and see if they boycotted it. And so far we have yet to find really anybody that actually, uh, without being prompted or without being told that we cared about taxes beforehand, actually is willing to say that they tax, they engage in a tax boycott. So kind of recognize this, this, this difference between what people say and what people do. The next thing what we're gonna do is we're going to actually try to measure real consumer behavior. So this is actually something that had been done in the Gallimore et al. Um, paper and, and in other papers as well, is they would look, for example, at quarterly sales following being in the news article. Uh, they, they basically find nothing, no, no change in sales. And what um, kind of we, believe about this test, and Jake, Jake is a, a co-author on that paper, we believe that it's basically just not a powerful enough test, right? It would have to be a pretty big thing to get people stop buying products to see it show up in quarterly sales. So what we try to do is try to find some other way that we could measure sales or, or some other outcome of a firm at a, a higher frequency than quarterly. And we were able to find this data set that's pretty widely used in the marketing literature, the Nielsen Retail Scanner data. So this is basically data uh, at the UPC level, the universal product code level that tells you the weekly number of these items that is sold. There's is actually available geographically. So we could do geographic cuts, although it would be um, pretty costly to do so. So, so far we haven't done any uh, geographic cuts, but for our sample, we basically have um, a company, they have thousands of these UPCs. We can see weekly purchase uh, activity for each of these UPCs. We're gonna merge this UPC database into another database, which actually tells us what companies own these UPCs. So then we can go to those company names and see if they're in the news about taxes. So here, this is to me, one of the biggest limitations of this particular way of looking at taxes and boycotts is we have to have a set of firms that have been in the news about taxes that sell stuff with barcodes. And that's a challenge because like a lot of Facebook products or a lot of Apple products, um, or these other types of firms that we, we traditionally think of as like very aggressive tax planners, and we've already mentioned a few times in this conference, don't sell many products in grocery stores. And so uh, what we have to do is find com companies that are, and so we do a LexisNexis search for these different terms associated with tax planning by corporations. We had uh, RAs read all these articles, then 
Uh, one of the researchers, that's specifically me, who read through the article, saw whether they agreed with the RA's characterizations. We ended up with 110 different articles for 23 different consumer-facing firms. And again, I would say this right here is kind of the weakness of this test is that there's not as many consumer-facing firms um, that engage in a lot of tax funding relative to other types of firms. But that's, uh, again, where our goal is to do different tests that all have different weaknesses. So again, what we're gonna do then is just see after the event happened, this news article came out, do we actually see a decrease in sales for these particular companies? And here is a graph, we like graphical evidence in this co-author team. So we have our event period here, the dots are the point estimates, the standard errors suggest that even five weeks out, you see, uh, you don't see a decline in sales that's, that's statistically different from zero, right? So then you have the kind of the tabulated form in, in regression format of, of this exact same thing. And you might think we're just like very fancy people who don't believe in stars because stars are for people who can't calculate their own uh, their own test of statistical significance. No, there are no stars because nothing's significant here. So even with this kind of very, very large uh, sample, I think we have a pretty high powered test. Um, we are unable to capture any kind of any significant effect on sales as it results to companies uh, having been featured in the news. Now, so we, we you know, I'm not going to talk about, I don't know, tabulated here all the other tests we run, but we did a lot of other tests, uh, basically found nothing. So, you know, things you got to be concerned about here, you know, a lot of different, these different pr products don't actually feature the, feature the company's name, right? So if Procter & Gamble is in the news for doing something with their taxes, you know, Procter & Gamble is in very few product names. So we do tests where, for example, we limit the sample of uh, consumer products that we use to those that actually have the company's name in their name. Uh, we look at the first time that you're in the news about taxes. So for example, you notice that we had a hundred some odd uh, events, but only 23 companies, maybe, you know, the second and third and fourth time you mentioned it isn't a big deal. We look at the, the first instances. So we do all these different tests. And again, it's just like a very, very dark night out there. Uh, no, no stars for most of these tests. And that is the scanner data result. Now, the third part of this paper is what we like to call the, what, well, I guess what some of us in the co-author group like to call ANIC data. And since uh, somebody else made the slides, I'll just stick to that turn. The ANIC data is basically like, we don't have like a, a ton of data. These are like pretty much good anecdotes, but maybe a little bit more data than just to call it an anecdote. So it's ANIC data. So the, the first instance here is basically if, if you were to approach any tax executive and say, you know, we're doing a study on if consumers boycott firms because of tax, they're instantaneous, and I've done this, right? The instantaneous result reaction is going to be, ah, of course they do like Starbucks. Everybody knows Starbucks was, was subject to like these wild consumer boycotts and everybody hated Starbucks and nobody was buying coffee. Everybody was tired because nobody was getting their caffeine for like weeks on end in the UK. And you, you'll hear this kind of story. And so what we're going to do is look specifically about this instance of Starbucks. So Starbucks, what exactly happened there is in late 2012 is actually uh, Starbucks 2013 fiscal year. Um, it came out in the UK that Starbucks had not paid or had paid very, very, very little tax in the UK for about the last decade. So they have a lot of different stores there, like any street you walk down in the UK, you're going to run into a Starbucks. And so people were pretty upset that they clearly saw that this store had been, this company had been there for a lot of time. There are a lot of outlets. People are buying a lot of coffee. They assumed they were very profitable. And yet a tax presumably based on profits wasn't generating any income from this particular store. And so people in the UK were, were, were pretty frustrated with this. So there were these protests. I showed you the signs of that. And so what we're basically going to do is say, can we see like in the available data and, and all of these data series have problems, but it's from the available data, can we actually see any result or any kind of proof that, that maybe this was a thing, that this is something that actually resulted in people buying much less coffee? So what do we have available to us? So from the 10K, Starbucks reports on a country by country basis, the net store openings. So we're gonna see if they opened fewer stores in the UK. We're gonna look at quarterly worldwide sales. So this would be similar to like what the Gallimore et al paper do. It'd have to be a big effect to see the worldwide quarterly sales decrease, but we're gonna look at it. We'll let annual sales by segment. This is also in the 10K where we can differentiate uh, US sales from non-US sales. And then probably the best test, but basically has no counterfactual, is you do get um, in the UK, uh, Starbucks does report their sales for their subsidiary Starbucks coffee 
uh, company in the UK, and we're going to look at that. So here are the graphs. This is the net store openings for these different countries. I, I just kind of picked a random set of countries here. There's nothing special about these countries other than they're big kind of uh, organized countries uh, where Starbucks has a big presence. So this is graphing the percentage change in net store openings by country. This big, fat, thick, dashed blue line here, that was a lot of descriptive words for this uh, particular line, is Starbucks in the UK. And you see it's pretty flat relative to these other lines. So we, in the paper, just show this graphically. You can run a regression, and, and as you guessed from the, the amount of variation in all the other countries, uh, this is very, very insignificant, right? So we don't see any net store closings or decrease in net store openings in the UK as a result of the Starbucks event in, uh, in its fiscal year 2013 compared to other countries. Uh, here, quarterly worldwide sales. Again, this is uh, this is not that fancy of a test. We're just like looking at this as well. We don't see like a big decrease there. Uh, likewise, in this is annual sales by geographic segment. So we have other countries besides the United States and the United States as reported in their 10K. And here we're looking in this area and we're really not seeing much of an effect there either. Again, this isn't like a super sophisticated, robust statistical test. We're just looking at these graphs and saying, it's not, it doesn't seem to be a whole lot there. Uh, this to me would be the, the best data that we have. Unfortunately, we don't have it for other countries at the same level. This is the total revenue of Starbucks coffee company per sale or per company on store uh, in pounds for coffee company or Starbucks Coffee Company Limited. So this is their UK subsidiary. And again, in this time period, you just don't really see that much change. So um, is it possible that Starbucks did have some like large decrease in sales in the UK as a result of this event? It certainly is. We have yet to find the data that would suggest that's the case though. Uh, and I think, I mean, this is an area that, that uh, especially any of you who have more experience with UK data would be happy to hear any other kind of ideas you have for how to, how to measure this effect. So the next piece of anecdote we have, there's this website and, and phone app. It's actually pretty neat. I have it on my phone. You can take it, you can scan any UPC in a store. You just like walk in Walmart as I do every morning on the way to work. Uh, you scan the barcode and it will tell you whether there is some active campaign against these products. And most things don't have an active campaign against them, but some do. So this, this website is called Bicot. Um, and so what we did is basically just look at all the different Bicot campaigns there were. Uh, the biggest campaign when we looked was pro-GMO or right to know. Um, and there are a lot of people that really are concerned about GMO foods and that we should be disclosing whether, whether there's GMO ingredients in foods. Uh, and we have here, that's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And then there's 95 other campaigns listed in the order of how many people subscribe to them. And then we have a few hundred people that have signed up for tell associated British foods to stop tax dodging in Zambia. So... Uh, it's not zero, so we have much bigger than a zero effect here, but it's a tiny fraction of the total boycott campaigns uh, that people have signed up for that are British, uh, British associated foods in, in Zambia and the, and the tax dodging that allegedly happens there. And then our last and final piece of uh, anecdote, and this, this is uh, hard to classify this, but we have it in the anecdote section in the paper. The, the, is, the idea here is basically we want frequent, we want something associated with what consumers do on a very frequent basis. So for a while at Robinhood, the trading platform, this is a trading platform for kind of retail investors that allows you to buy in fractional shares from your phone. Uh, it's, it's like a lot of people who don't have much experience in the, in the stock market and interested in, in trading stock. What we do here is basically use data that they released on the number of Robinhood traders that own each firm and look at whether that amount changes uh, on the day around these different news events. So the limitation here is we're, we're basically saying like a Robinhood trader is going to buy stocks like they're going to buy soybeans or chocolate or coffee. Uh, you know, that, that may or may not be true. We think there is some basis in the literature for thinking that, that consumers in the stock market, especially like kind of at the low end retail level, it does have something to do with their just familiarity with the product, how they feel personally about them and not strict with the future cash flows of the firm. But again, that, that's a limitation of, the, of this paper here that we're kind of asserting that consumer preferences have something to do with stock preferences for the type of person who uses uh, Robinhood. And so again, what we're going to do is look at whether you see fewer Robinhood traders owning these 
uh, firms that had some negative tax news. And in the three day event window around that, we, we again see, see nothing. We just don't see any change in uh, share or people holding. Again, we can only view at that margin. It could be that they sell some of their shares, still keep some of that firm in their portfolio. That could be, we just can't observe that in our data. So what do we got? So we basically have very, very little to no evidence that consumers actually boycott tax planning, right? So we did a survey. Uh, we get some, a few, a few people saying they actually have boycotted, but none for taxes. Taxes don't seem to be uh, important for purchase behavior. Uh, people just don't seem to, in our survey, have thought that much about taxes. When you prompt them to think about taxes, still only about 10% of people say they have boycotted about taxes, but that's only after having been reminded. Uh, the scanner data, which is kind of reflective of reality in that you actually do see real purchases, the limitation of, of course, being that you only see them for the kind of firms that, that have uh, UPC labels on products. Um, you see no difference during these tax news events. So you see a headline, you see for prominent products, all these different tests that we saw. We can't see much of an effect for people actually buying less stuff afterwards. Uh, then we have the, the Anic data, Starbucks, Robinhood, and Bicot. Again, where we see very, very, very little. Now to be clear, you know, I started out motivating this paper by saying the reputational cost of tax planning and then jumped straight to consumers. There are other constituency groups which you would, we would worry about. So for example, you might think that if you're in the news about taxes, that's gonna irritate some politician who's gonna pass a law that's bad for you. Or you're in the news about taxes, I actually talked with a, a former CFO of a, of a very, 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 by some measures, the largest corporation on earth. Uh, this former CFO basically said like, there is a reputational cost of tax planning, doesn't have anything to do with consumers. For our firm, it's about like government organizations and government agencies, you irritate them and they'll, they'll cause you problems. Um, but what we're looking at is one particular group and that is for consumers. Um, and, we, and we basically find that for consumers, we are unable to document using a variety of tests and a variety of settings that all have, uh, all have problems, but different problems. We're unable to find any change in purchase behavior around negative tax events, suggesting that if there is a reputational cost to, to, to tax planning, it is um, unlike to, to be through the consumer channel. And uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let me try this here, I hope this works. So if, if it doesn't work, if you cannot see the video for some reason, uh, please, Jeff, shout out. I can always just discuss my own paper too. I come from my side. My name is Inga Hadek. I'm at University of um, Regensburg. I'm very sorry that I cannot be here today, so I hope that you're all enjoying the conference. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to um, discuss the paper tax boycotts. It was a pleasure to read the paper. I think the paper is already very well developed, so I hope that my comments are helpful to Jeff in this um, co-author. Since I've only 10 minutes um, for my discussion, I will skip the summary um, and I'm pretty convinced that Jeff will have done a very good job in presenting the paper. So what do I like about the paper? It's a very topical research question. Since the Game War 2014 paper, it's the first study that looks at actual sales and given um, that we face an increasing salience of tax avoidance, um, since then the study is also very interesting from a timing perspective. Um, of course, it's, um, I like that you examine tax boycotts from different angles. Um, you use a mixed method approach. The data quality is very high with a representative survey of more than 500 consumers. The weekly scanner level data on um, consumer purchases that enable you to, um, to also look at short term changes in sales. Um, the study has multiple robustness tests and the additional analyses. So I think it's the most comprehensive study on um, tax induced um, consumer behavior so far and it's definitely going to be a successful paper. So first of all, in terms of um, motivation, 
Um, you state on page two that compared to other stakeholder groups, consumers have received far less focus on the literature, despite a central role as stakeholders. Um, and I would question that um, sentence. I think that, at least in my understanding, um, maybe except for investors, consumers have been the stakeholder groups that prior research um, has considered the most. If you think about employees, for instance, who are also very important uh, stakeholders, uh, there's only one paper out there, and I could mention some further stakeholder groups. So, um, I mean, there are all these um, archival studies on perceived or expected consumer effects. There are a lot of experimental studies, and you cite them all. So, um, when motivating the paper, I would um, stick to the mixed method approach, the high data quality, and the fact that you complement um, these existing papers on perceived effects and experiments. When uh, reading the paper, um, especially in your conclusion section, one gets the impression that um, you rule out the existence of reputational effects with consumers. Um, and I'm a bit um, reluctant when it comes to that. So um, even if you just consider reputation with regard to consumers, um, I think it's a um, reputation is a very broad and multifaceted construct. And, um, it helps firms um, to increase their brand value. Um, reputation has an impact on sales on a short-term and long-term perspective. And of course, also on the willingness of consumers to pay um, price premiums. And um, in this paper, you, um, you, you focus, of course, on short-term sales. Um, and what you also need to consider is that um, News about tax avoidance can have um, interaction effects uh, with other CSR activities, um, such as perceptions of hypocrisy, for instance, that then have an effect on reputation, and this is very difficult to measure. Um, you also have to consider the existing brand value of firms that got caught and um, the costs of boycotting a firm from a consumer perspective. So this paper here focuses on sales, which is a very good measure for real economic effects. Um, yet I would be a bit more cautious when interpreting results and not rule out the existence of reputational effects in general, because these effects um, can be um, way broader. Um, what I would also do is to link um, your results to, um, to findings from the CSR literature. Um, for instance, um, in your conclusion, um, you state that maybe um, tax executives have um, consistently uh, taxes on their mind and they may expect taxes to be more of a concern than consumers appear to consider them to be. And when reading this, um, this sentence, I thought that um, maybe it's not a very tax specific finding. Um, because it's, I think it's a general issue in CSR research that we face this huge difference between um, talk and perceptions of consumers and actual consumer behavior. If we think about um, fast fashion, organic food, animal welfare, there's always this, this gap between um, talk um, and behavior. So maybe it's not a tax specific issue, issue, maybe it's more about the, the ethical consumer in general. So I would link uh, results to the CSR literature and um, elaborate on the question whether consumers don't care about taxes or whether maybe um, they don't care about uh, CSR in general when it comes to their um, purchase behavior. Um, I have two, two comments on the structure of the paper. Um, in your additional analyses, you present this um, analysis of tax-related boycotts using um, archival data from a boycotting app um, called Boycott. Um, in terms of timing, um, calls to boycott a firm or its product should, um, should happen prior to the actual boycott. So, um, I would suggest to, um, to move this chapter or to shift this chapter um, prior to your analysis of actual sales. So present the consumer survey first, um, then this um, bycode data analysis, and then your analysis of actual um, sales. 
Um, also, in your um, your additional analysis, there is this um, examination of retail traders' uh, stock holdings to further investigate the link between corporate reputation and tax plan. So, in my understanding, um, retail traders act in the role of investors, not in the role of consumers. So, I would subsume them under the stakeholder group of private investors. Um, in the end, uh, nearly every stakeholder is also a consumer. If you think about um, members of tax authorities, employees, or private investors, all of them are also um, consumers. So maybe a reviewer asked for it, and you can just ignore my comment. But to me, this analysis seemed to be a bit distracting, given um, the weak link uh, with consumer boycotts. So there are some, some further comments um, on your survey. So at the beginning of your survey, you ask these open questions on uh, reasons consumers have boycotted a firm or would boycott a firm. And my impression is that um, there was a tendency to present um, broad and general answers. So um, the answer illegal, unethical or dishonest behavior ranked fourth or first um, in, um, in the survey. So um, I think this answer here can include a variety of reasons, including, of course, tax avoidance or tax evasion. And it's quite difficult to rule that out. So I would at least discuss this issue and um, make clear that um, consum consumers do not directly identify taxes as a reason to boycott. There are also some, some questions um, where you present prompted reasons to punish um, a firm. And um, there consumers have to rank different activities that are perceived by at least some as socially irresponsible. Um, but when looking um, at the different activities um, that you presented to consumers, um, they consist of a mix of legal and illegal corporate activities. And um, CSI in general focuses on voluntary activities that go beyond just complying with laws. So activities like bribery, fraud, or discriminatory hiring would be more comparable to tax evasion than to tax avoidance. So um, to me, it's not very surprising that um, consumers tend to um, punish more such illegal types of behavior relative to legal, but maybe socially irresponsible types of behavior like um, tax avoidance. When it comes to your analysis of retail scanner data, I was wondering whether the coding of events um, could be a problem given that you used articles from different points of time, but on the same firm. Um, because for each article, uh, weeks minus 10 to minus 6 and 6 to 10 are treated as baseline. So maybe it's a problem. It's not a problem, but I wanted to bring that up um, just to, to think about. I was also a bit surprised to see that um, the number of firms um, in the sample is rather small. So uh, you do have a lot of articles, um, but um, these articles concern only 23 firms. And um, the number, of course, gets smaller in your refined analyses. So I was just wondering whether there were any possibilities to increase um, your sample size, maybe by looking at further newspapers. In terms of limitations, there are two limitations that I would discuss in more detail in the conclusion section. So first of all, the paper only looks at US consumers. And um, I think there's a risk that perceptions of tax avoidance and also reactions to tax avoidance um, are less negative among US consumers. So it's purely anecdotal, but when I was traveling in Alaska, I saw this car here and I never saw such a car um, in Europe, for instance. There are also some papers out there, some theoretical, some, some empirical papers um, that um, highlight differences between US consumers and international consumers or consumers from other countries. So um, maybe um, reactions to tax avoidance um, are stronger outside the US. And uh, this could explain 
um, the gap between your findings and findings in prior archivist studies on perceived or expected consumer reactions among managers and investors. Um, another limitation I would, um, I would discuss in more detail is the fact that, of course, your study can only rely on those firms that got caught. And um, this can lead um, to an underestimation of the true consumer cost of tax avoidance, uh, because it's not unlikely that um, firms that don't need to fear any um, negative consequences with their consumers tend to engage um, in more tax avoidance and are also more likely, um, of course, to get caught. Um, maybe because these firms, or maybe because boycotting these firms um, comes at high cost for consumers. If you think about um, Starbucks, um, Apple, um, Amazon, Microsoft, um, of course you can boycott these firms as a consumer, but it's um, really not easy for you when it comes at um, high costs. Another minor note on interpreting um, results. Um, when reading the paper, um, sometimes I get the impression that expectations on possible consumer reactions are a bit too high. So I was wondering whether one, one can really expect um, substantial consumer boycotts um, for firms um, that are mentioned in a non-headline article together with other firms. And can we really expect that um, a firm like Starbucks needs, uh, needs to close shops because of um, news about tax avoidance? So I think um, in your study, you find significant results when one should expect consumer boycotts to be most likely, as it's the case in these headline articles. So to me, this emphasizes that there can be effects, but under, under very specific um, circumstances. Um, to sum up, I think it's a great paper. It was a pleasure to read it, um, and I wish you all the best um, with this paper. Okay, thanks, Inga. <laughs> it's not here, but um, I would still let me give you, Jeff, a uh, couple of minutes to respond. We're, we're basically re recording response video to Inga, um, so she'll see it. Uh, and maybe you can also pick up on Johanna's comment, who made a similar comment as Inga has made, that maybe British consumers are uh, care while uh, U.S. consumers don't. Um, I think um, there's a lot, of, a lot of good points. I really appreciate the feedback. So one um, thing that was mentioned is that you know in the, in the survey you did, people did say that one of the biggest problems they had, in some cases, the very biggest problem they had is illegal, unethical, or dishonest behavior. And the challenge is, is that could be tax related, right? We really have no way of knowing. So what we can see is the text string that they wrote out, and in no cases uh, in things that we categorized as being that, did they say anything about taxes? And then none of the companies in the cases where they actually boycotted, none of the companies that we listed are like prominent cases of tax uh, evasion, uh, but other like illegal or unethical or dishonest behavior. But we can't rule out that they that someone might have met taxes. And it kind of, kind of a limitation of what we wanted to do is just like not say anything about taxes and let people say what they want to say. They can't really control what they say or the specificity with what they say. But we can see the, the examples of the companies that they wrote down. And um, at least from our view, those don't seem to be ta tax related. Um, it is, I mean, like I mentioned, my, my biggest problem with their retail data is we don't have that many articles and we don't have that many firms. I think what's interesting about this though is, is to some extent it, that just that fact alone kind of helps answer our research question, right? If the question is, do people really get upset about taxes and stop buying stuff? If you go to the media and there's just not that many articles specifically about this kind of firm, like it's hard to get upset about news that doesn't ever exist. Uh, so we've looked quite a bit for more articles. Um, I think one one um, result of the taxes and media paper, the, the Chenadol paper, uh, says there's really like we as researchers think that there's like thousands of these articles out there because we love reading these articles and we talk to our classes about those articles. But when you sit down and actually try to collect them in some comprehensive way, uh, there's fewer than we actually think. That to some extent, to me, just suggests normal people don't care about this nearly as much as we might think they do. And then to address the question that Johannes, uh, as, as well as the discussant brought up, this is a, an important part, right? Um, 
as much as I hate to admit it, the United States is not the only country in the world. There is like a, a broader world out there and people outside the United States might care about these issues. So we do look at US consumers only for the first part and for the second part. Uh, we survey only US consumers. Their retail scanner data is only from the US. And the only non-US thing we do is look at the UK data series, some of which involve uh, UK FX. Uh, but it's true we could do do more to do uh, to look outside the United States. We're trying to tie back to what U.S. tax executives say they're concerned about, but they could be, I mean, they don't say this, but they could say, yes, we don't do this because we're afraid to be, um, we're afraid of these reputational costs, people buy less of our stuff, and they could mean like people in other countries. Now, if that, uh, and that, that could certainly be the case that we have yet, yet to do much with. Um, and that's all I have to say. If, any, if anybody has any other questions, comments, thoughts, complaints. Question by Johannes. Go ahead. Yeah, following up on what Inga said about the endogeneity of engaging in, in risky tax avoidance behavior, uh, could you follow up on that? Because yes. I thought it was pretty telling that in this UK case, that it was not only Starbucks, it was on, also Google who was sort of caught, right? And then they reacted very differently. Starbucks said, well, we have a problem because people can substitute the type of coffee apparently pretty well. Uh, so we'll, 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 uh, we'll say we're guilty, pay voluntarily some 50 million something uh sort of well, uh, yeah to to get out of this whereas google said you know we are responsible to our shareholders <laughs> they said openly in the parliament right and i for me that was pretty telling because google is you know you can try other search machines but it's not the same as the other cup of coffee so i was wondering if she really has a point there that it's only the quasi monopolists who can really afford to really not care about the reputation with respect to tax because the benefit of doing that is much smaller than for other firms yeah so i, mean, I think it's a it's a, an excellent point i mean it's not only that there's just like other search engines aren't nearly as good as google but the second third fourth and fifth best search engine machines also have their own tax tax problems it's not as if uh, they're all clean as far as taxes go so it certainly is the case that you would expect products with more substitutes to be more sensitive and there are substitutes to starbucks I think what's interesting about the Starbucks uh, example is that you would expect their response and how they responded to it to be in some um, in some regards like quantitatively similar to how big they think internally the problem actually is. So they paid for two years in a row, 10 million pounds per year uh, voluntarily to say like, oh, look, we're gonna just like pay so much in taxes, but 10 million pounds per year for Starbucks UK is, is to me just like such a small amount that it suggests to them how much they actually value this, this, this problem. Um, I do agree, I mean, this is probably one of, the, so I mentioned some of the problems with the individual tests as I was presenting the paper. I do think kind of one of the biggest problems with the paper in general is exactly this endogeneity thing, right? We can only observe the companies that were caught and companies who are engaging in this type of tax planning were anticipating the consumer response when they did it, right? So they actively thought, well, we're going to be engaged in this type of tax planning and if we get caught, there's gonna be this problem. They were gonna be in the news. And uh, if we're in the news, we don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal. So they engage knowing that there could be this potential, potential backlash. So, I mean, it is a little bit of a, a kind of a nuance, but I think it's, it's difficult to answer the question, like do consumers boycott in general? I think we can answer very well the question did consumers boycott for the type of firms that actually engage in tax in tax planning and were caught? And there are two different questions, and one is like the empirical, the the theoretical reality we'd like to be able to address. The second is the empirical reality we are able to address, and maybe we need to do a better better job explaining the difference between those two things. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. First one was from Mary Margaret. Uh, can you examine the relation of survey participants' answers to early questions, e.g., dishonest? To later questions where you introduce tax to see participants who said dishonesty is an issue early are more likely to say tax is an issue later. Uh, we have not done that. We certainly could. That would be a good. I mean, and I do think this is a legitimate concern. Like dishonest could be taxes. So I would would uh, welcome other ideas for how to, to disentangle whether they might have meant taxes. So this would be a good idea to do that. 
Second question comes from Sebastian. Uh, is lack of evidence of consumer response evidence that consumers don't much care or rather that com companies are successful in counteracting negative reputational effects? A bit related to what uh, Johannes said. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So, um, I mean, I've wanted to write this taxes and ta like some kind of outcome on a frequent basis. Actually, let me back up even more. When I saw the Gallimore paper, I first thought like, wow, this is an amazing idea. I wish I would have written this paper. Then I just saw all these null results. And I thought like, of course, like at a quarterly level, you don't expect the result to be that big. We need some kind of finer level. And I've gone through many, many different things in trying to think about how to address it. And one was you can actually get advertising data on a weekly level basis uh, and try to address the problem. I went down that path. It turned out to be much messier and nastier than I thought. So kind of was halted on that path as I am on most paths that I go down. Um, but it is certainly true that firms could be adjusting along other margins, which makes it so that can, you don't see any the number of units changing. So in the Nielsen data, we are observing, I believe the number of units, they could be changing the price. They could be changing the perception by like actively advertising a lot. Um, so we know at the, at the quarterly level, Gallimore looks at changes in advertising, Gallimore at all look at changes in advertising, they pay no changes in advertising at the quarterly level. I'd like to do it at a more high fr frequency, uh, have not done it, but that, that's a possibility. They could be responding along other margins, which make it so that consumers uh, aren't changing their behavior. Very good. So since we're running out of time, I'm gonna close it here. Um, uh, Unless you want to have some final comments to some of the questions, otherwise we will Watch definitely, out for Scott. yeah, we will definitely send out the uh, uh, send the the transcript of the chat to all the authors. And yeah, so this is the point where uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially the presenters, uh, for doing a great job and then discussions for contributing so much, but also to the audience. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, especially during the panel. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, I hope it was insightful to everyone. Um, we will record, we have recorded this, so we will um, uh, as, as try to produce videos of this and, and send it to all participants so we can, uh, you can rewatch whatever uh, you think you've missed. Um, uh, and we will also try to gather the funding that we have not used this year, right? So this was a relatively low budget event for us. Uh, but we'll try to gather these funds and have the same event, uh, hopefully again next year. Uh, and with everyone here in person, that would be kind of my favorite. Uh, until then, have a great summer. Um, and thanks everyone for joining in and, and making this a very insightful event.